Hello, and uh, welcome to another lesson of financial modeling and valuation brought to you by Wall Street Prep, wallstreetprep.com. You can download this file we're going to be working through today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, doing a leverage buyout of a company and how to analyze that. Okay? Now, you might think an LBO is for the masters of the finance universe, okay? but that's not necessarily the case. If you have ever uh, bought a house, or considering buying a house, buying a home is an LBO. Okay? You, you go to the bank, you take out a mortgage, that's your debt, you put in a little equity. Over time, uh, you're working, presumably, and paying down that debt over time. And then uh, you sell your house a few years later. Hopefully your house is appreciated in value. Um, but when you sell your house, you've, you've paid down the debt. You sell your house, you take those proceeds, uh, you pay off the remaining balance of the debt, if there is any. Uh, and then you get to keep the rest. And you can generate huge returns uh, potentially that way. So really buying a home is no different than an LBO. But we're going to go ahead and, and build a, a hypothetical uh, LBO model. Just kind of a quick one, 30,000 foot view, uh, so you know how it, how it could be done. Uh, so we're going to buy this fictitious company. We're the financial sponsor. That's our perspective. We're going to buy out uh, this fictitious company XYZ. And we're going to buy them on the last day of 2012, just for simplicity. And you can see I've got some comments over here as well. So download the file and you can follow along with the comments. So we need some select operating and financial statement data. We have some assumptions about the LBO. Uh, we have just kind of a very simple financial model and very simple debt schedule. And then we're going to answer these six questions. Again, we're going to buy out this firm the last day of 2012. They're trading at $30 currently, 500 million shares outstanding. Of course, share price times shares gives us market cap. So $15 billion company. Now, that company currently has some debt on its books, $600 million worth, uh, but they also have some cash, $100 million worth. So we'll calculate net debt. And, of course, the rationale behind this, is, you know, net debt is debt minus cash, the rationale being that any cash sitting around on a company's books uh, on the balance sheet can be used to pay down debt. And if we buy this company, uh, we have to buy out its equity. We typically have to pay off its current debt, but... When we acquire the company, we also get that company's cash. Okay, so it makes some logical sense that we can, when we get that company's cash, we can use that cash to pay down the debt. And then we'll also calculate enterprise value. First, enterprise value commonly defined as market cap plus net debt. It's the value of a firm's operations. Here's our select some historical financial statement data. Last 12 months, LTM revenue six billion, EBITDA of 2.4. And free cash flows, $480 million. What we can do right now, we can calculate our enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. The company is currently trading at six and a half times its EBITDA. It's, it's trading enterprise value, six and a half times EBITDA. Just a common, uh, commonly quoted valuation multiple. Now, as the financial sponsor, we're not going to hold on to this investment forever. We're going to buy out the company, and our holding period for most financial sponsors typically three to seven years into the future. So we will assume that we're going to exit on the very last date, 2016. That's when we're going to sell off the business or maybe to a strategic acquirer, or maybe we'll take the equity public again and IPO it. Okay. But we're going to exit the business at the end of 2016. Now we need to know how much debt we can actually borrow. And now this is based on current debt market conditions. Okay. You know, what's, what's going on with, with debt markets, uh, how much are, are lenders willing to lend to us based on the riskiness of the proposed transaction and the company. We want to borrow as much debt as possible, but not so much that we put the company into financial distress. Now, this debt capacity is going to change over time. It's just as, as you know, what's going on in the debt markets change. But we're just going to assume that we can borrow six times EBITDA. This is also known as a leverage ratio. Additionally, we must maintain some kind of minimum cash balance on hand just in case of a rainy day. And we're going to assume that that's $50 million. Maybe, maybe our projections don't turn out at quite as rosy as we believe that they will. So we want to have some kind of minimum cash balance to maintain you know, our obligations, pay our employees, uh, and so forth. We're going to assume that that's $50 million. Uh, we're going to exit in 2016, like I mentioned, and we're going to exit at the same multiple we are going to enter at. Okay, we're going, We can buy the company for six and a half times EBITDA. We're going to sell it for six and a half times EBITDA. 
generally speaking, assuming expansion of, of multiples is, it's, that's a little aggressive of an assumption. So we'll just say, okay, we'll sell it for six and a half times EBITDA, the same that we can buy the company for. And based on the riskiness of this transaction, we, the financial sponsor, must earn 25% over our holding period each year. Of course, interest rates are calculated annually. We must earn 25% every year. This is our internal rate of return, our IRR. And it's high because of the, the higher uh, risk of this transaction. Remember, we're borrowing a bunch of debt. So it's going to make the, the riskiness of this transaction a little bit higher. So, of course, the higher the risk, the greater we need, the, the greater the potential returns we need as a financial sponsor. So we're going to say that that's 25% required rate of return. And what we'll do quickly, we'll build up some financial statement uh, information. We're not going to build a complete three-statement financial model, of course. Uh, we just need a little bit, just doing a high-level overview of LBO. So for simplicity, we're going to assume revenues will grow at 10% each year. So they had uh, six billion in revenues, 2012, and we're going to grow each revenue, uh, each year's revenues by 10 percent. Again, then just copy that out. We need a, some forecast and financial statement data to calculate our potential returns once we exit. And for simplicity, the company's historical EBITDA margin was 40 percent. For simplicity, we're going to keep it constant as well. Of course, margin being uh, something as a percentage of sales. So calculate EBITDA again, 40% of revenues. And then I just copied that out to the right. We also need some cash flow metrics as well. Again, we're not going to build a, a full cash flow statement. We're just going to keep, again, everything consistent. We're going to assume that uh, cash flows after required debt pay down are going to come in at 8% of sales every year. So make that calculation and then copy it out. Of course, we, we don't have a full-blown balance sheet. Uh, we really don't need it. We're primarily concerned with cash and debt for this analysis. Of course, our the historical cash the company had on hand was 100 million from our earlier assumption and then 600 million in debt straight from our earlier assumption. And then our net debt is already calculated. So what we'll do next, we'll build out our debt schedule and our abbreviated balance sheet, but we're going to do that in the next lesson. So stay tuned for part 2.